COVID shined a light on the issues that the early education field had already been struggling with for years. Going back to normal is simply not good enough. Our teachers deserve more. If you are ready to be bold, address systemic inequity, and elevate the workforce, we invite you to join us March 15th through 17th for Interact Now, a class summit. Choose from 30 sessions over three days and network with leading experts, share your work, and meet colleagues across the world. Visit teachstone.com slash interact to learn more and register. Hello and welcome back to Impacting the Classroom. In each episode, you'll hear from educators, policymakers, and researchers who are making an impact in education. Today's topic is about funding, and we have some real experts that we're going to hear from, and we're excited about the conversation today. I'm Dr. Darlene Estes Del Rey. And I'm Marnetta Larimer. Today, I'm joined by two esteemed guests who will share federal policy updates and what that means for funding early childhood education. My first guest is Ann Hedgepath. Ann Hedgepath is a Child Care Aware of America's Deputy Chief of Policy. Welcome, Ann. <laughs> and I'm also excited to be joined by Tiffany Lee, who serves as the prenatal to three policy advisor for City of Seattle Department of Education and Early Learning. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. So investing in early childhood means funding programs and innovative strategies for children. And numerous studies have demonstrated that children with access to quality early learning are more prepared for kindergarten. And can you summarize what's happening at the federal level that may lead to more funding for early childhood programs? Yeah, thanks for that question, because it is a big moment for child care and early learning when it comes to policy and particularly the opportunity that's ahead of us for increased investment in child care and early learning. Um, I think folks know this, but it's worth saying that the model right now isn't working and there is just not enough investment in child care and early learning. And that gets passed through to parents. They are paying a price that's way too high or out of reach. It gets passed through to educators who see suppressed wages and who, you know, ultimately continue the incredible job of caring for children, despite some of the really challenging elements of the career path related to compensation. And we need to change that, right? We need to fix that. And ultimately, we have a chance to do that. And in some ways, it's really exciting to say that Congress and the White House have identified investing in child care and early learning as a priority. As a result of the pandemic, relief funding is flowing to child care and early learning, over $50 billion over the past 18 months, and states are working to get that out the door, but that is not a long-term solution. And so we saw in the spring of 2021 that President Biden proposed a longer-term investment in child care, and Congress has drafted a bill called the Build Back Better Act that would do just that. It would put for six years over $400 Hundred billion dollars in childcare and preschool, and really make a difference in terms of bringing the price of childcare down for families. We'd see a majority of families be eligible for subsidy, or maybe even have no copay when it comes to affording childcare. And we'd see states really change the way they pay childcare programs and providers, making sure there were living wages for our educators, and making sure that the money needed to build high quality programs flows into our child care system. So it's really exciting. And I think it's totally worth us talking about how to get it done because this is how we would transform and will transform child care in the coming years. So thinking about some of that funding, when and how can providers access this money? Great question. Um, so right now, and you know, like I said, this isn't the long-term solution, but it's also really important given the moment we're in. States are distributing funding that they received from the three different COVID relief packages over the course of 2020 and 2021. Those are known as the CARES Act, 
SIRSA or CURSA, a long acronym that, you know, at the end of the day, hardly matters, and the American Rescue Plan Act, which all three taken together are putting a lot of money into the child care system. And states are right now standing up stabilization grants, and those are available to programs and providers, and they can be used for a whole host of things. There are many states, most states, who have applications up right now, and a few stragglers who we expect to have up in the next few weeks, so in early 2022. And I think it's really important for programs and providers to know that that money is available. And in most states, their applications are open or they've had one round of grants and may have a second round coming, but it is worth reaching out to some of those system leaders who can be really helpful. Your state lead agency, check out their website, your child care resource and referral agency. In many states, they're helping distribute the funds and provide technical assistance. And that money is about you know, paying your mortgage, rent, dealing with paying your staff, increasing compensation, recruitment bonuses, paying yourself. If you haven't been for years, this is all about stabilizing the child care system and that those resources are available right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Tiffany, I know you're a fierce advocate for family child care programs. Tell me how they fit into that equation and how they can access the funding. Absolutely. As Anne had mentioned, these state lead agencies are dispersing or making available these uh, these grants, the stabilization grants. And just like their center counterparts, family child care providers can connect with their local child care aware um, organizations or even state licensors. I think that part of the money that was given to states um, is sort of allocated for technical assistance and for marketing and outreach, um, which I thought was a really great and exciting thing. It's a recognition that um, you can't just make it available. Um, Access is about um, translation of materials because so many of our providers um, serve emerging English learners. And um, I think for family child care, um, there's this sense that people uh, in this field are doing it because they have good hearts and they love children. And I think that that's true. But when we talk about money and childcare, it's almost as if we expect childcare providers to not make a profit. Like it's right. evil. Like they're not in it for the money. Well, they should be able to pay their mortgage or their rent, or they should be able to um, have a car that doesn't break down all the time. So I always think it's interesting when we talk about the financing of childcare and, and you have so many great points and I'm also very hopeful. This is a very exciting time. And I think it's um, a silver lining in, in this really profoundly heartbreaking scenario and circumstance of COVID-19 is, is the world stopped. And uh, I feel like early childhood and childcare providers in particular emerged as leaders and and essential. We really saw the field as being essential, not just to child development, which absolutely it is, um, but to the economy. So we are sort of like garnering support from corners of the the world that we didn't know that we would have support from. I love that you mentioned that the profit piece. I think a lot of times people don't understand how much it costs (laughs) <laughs> to run a child care facility. <laughs> so making a profit is hard, right? It'd be great as a goal, but I mean, with regulations and, you know, paying the insurance for the transportation and like just all of the costs in that, there's never enough money <laughs> to support, you know, running a facility. And so I, I do think a lot of times they just, we don't think about the cost of running that specific type of business right? Educating your teachers, right? They have to have so many clock hours, like just all of the different things and the amount of money, you know, that it costs to do that. Oh, I love what you're saying. And I think now, especially with um, everyone having, being challenged with um, a workforce sort of like um, shortage, it's more important than ever that we're paying these educators to keep them, to retain them, and even to attract people. If you have a choice between working at um, Starbucks or Target, 
um, or being, you know, following your heart and your calling in life, it shouldn't be the difference between health insurance and not health insurance or like being able to pay, you know, um, for a place to live or not being able to pay for a place to live. Thank you, Marnetta. I agree. And I also think that one of the things that you're each identifying is that, you know, this isn't about sort of a race to the bottom and who can create the cheapest childcare, that this is about a recognition of what it takes to build and invest in high quality child care and early learning um, that is developmentally appropriate, where educators can invest in themselves and their professional development. And the it, it, it is hard to say this, but like, that does take money, right? Like, that is about our priorities, um, our priorities um, in our communities and as a country, and building a partnership where the appropriate amounts of resources come from families and from our, you know, public investment as a whole and from us all as a part of investing in the future, we're on the cusp of getting so much closer to a better formula, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, because right now that it doesn't add up and it doesn't add up for so many programs who are, who are really struggling to figure out how to make it work. And for so many families who get priced out and for whom access is not real, um, because they can't afford it or they can't afford the kind of child care that, that they're looking for, the high quality child care they're looking for. And I think those dynamics are all very caught up in also, you know, just the math, right? The math that so many um, program directors, owners, and educators are dealing with every day. I appreciate that, Anne. And I think with the family child care providers, I think the you know, the pandemic has also revealed just how how amazing they are as essential workers, even beyond the fact that they showed up and stayed the course. But I think it also revealed to folks how flexible they are mm -hmm. and how they meet families where they need them in the outside the normal hours. Like they, they constantly do that, whether, you know, it's, it's different days of the week and different times of the day. And, and I think that's kind of setting up a different model for folks to think about like, what do families really need? And, but what's the price of that? And what's the quality? It's all kind of wrapped around that. But Tiffany, I'm also curious just to, in the space of the family child care providers, like, what are you hearing about how they want to use the money and maybe what they're hoping for, or also like what you're hoping that they might think about, you know, maybe one of a two pronger there, like, what do you hear there? You know, maybe they're wanting to use the money for, and then maybe what you're hoping they might also consider. Well, that's a great question. I've heard a range of, of things, as you'd mentioned, um, as Anne had mentioned, actually, um, states sort of vary where they, in terms of where they are in dispensing these funds. I've heard everything from um, I've been putting off fixing the toilet that, you know, is leaking and is causing my water bill to be higher than it really should all the way to I'm I'm putting this away because this might happen again, you know, and there might be a period where children can't be in, in care and I'm not going to have an income. And so I'm hearing everything um, and between those. A lot of people are talking about catching up. Um, things that they had put off and not even luxuries. Um, it, it, they just feel uh, like very practical um, expenses right now. And I think it's a manifestation again of our, of our really flawed financing system of childcare. I hope that they would use it on things um, and not feel like they're being selfish. Cause I get, again, um, I really feel um, based on the um, child care, family child care providers, I know that there's this like proclivity to uh, selflessness as if that's a good thing. Um, and then at the same time, um, so that's our sort of unspoken expectation, but at the same time, we uh, facilitate trainings about self-care. Um, and it's just really uh, ironic and unfortunate, not sort of putting money aside. I'd like for a uh, all of us to mobilize around this, this momentum that we've built around um, how essential and necessary um, family child care is, um, especially uh, to your point, Darlene, about um, non-traditional hours. Um, I think about uh, our shift and pivot to the, the gig economy and how that is sort of um, challenging the way we think about the nine to five. 
um, and, and will need care for that. Also thinking about single parents, single fathers, single mothers, and how um, in order for them to sort of um, continue and continue to progress in their career, they really need reliable and trustworthy childcare and have found it in, um, you know, family child care providers, but um, it should be compensated fairly. So I sort of answered it. Uh. <laughs> oh, I love that. I think that, that you've touched on many of those things. And and I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Otherwise, I, I think Marnetta has I, I do. I'm biting to talk. Like, I'm just like, there's so many things that Tiffany said mm-hmm. that I just want to follow up on. I think, you know, across states, to some states, family child care isn't really legitimized, right? Like, so my question would be when we're talking about funding and the value of family child care, right? How do we ensure that family child care who um, providers who are not licensed, right, but still provide quality services have access to what they need as well, right? Because he, like here in the state of Louisiana, we don't license family child care. Mm-hmm. Right. They can be registered, but they still don't have access to all of the things <laughs> legally. Right. The funding. They don't have access to the pools of money that other facilities have access to. So how do we support them? I think um, typically they don't uh, uh, license exempt or registered um uh, family child care providers, uh, they, they don't typically have access to these, but I, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Anne, um, I think that uh, these ARPA funds are available to family friends and neighbor care and um, family child care providers. Yeah, so what we're seeing, yeah, well, so one of the things I really want to name, and I'm so glad you brought this up, is that states have dramatically different systems across the country. And we use terms like licensed and registered and regulated, um, license exempt. They mean different things in different places. And the work that child care programs, family child care, in some cases, faith-based child care programs are a part of all of those various um, pools Um, The work that they do to be high quality is often um, not a part of some of the things that maybe they do to be recognized in the state right now, because those aren't very well aligned. And we do also allow many of the programs who are registered, regulated, license exempt to participate in things like the subsidy system, right? And that's because there is a mishmash across the country in terms of requirements. Ultimately, relief funds have generally been made available to programs that, one, are part of the subsidy system. And in many states, that means that they are licensed, registered, regulated, something in that whole category. And other states have been using some of the funds, which they're allowed to from certain pools of it, to reach even those that aren't part of the subsidy system through grants or other forms of support. So it is possible, and I think this is an important message to folks is it is possible that there is some support out there for you. And one of the things we learned in the pandemic is that so many states don't have great rates ways to reach every single child care educator or program or provider. And they may be seeking to build pathways for many of those to become in to a more recognized system to support them in their quality efforts to do work that would make a difference in their communities. And we don't have a great way to operationalize that. And that has to change. And some states have really changed that over the course of the pandemic. They've had things like their child care resource and referral agency have like called every single program and provider in the state that they can find to update information and get their email address. I know in several states where CCR and our staff is going door to door to programs and providers carrying tablets to help them to pr- uh, apply for any of the grants that are available. There are some really cool things happening. Uh, Child Care of Kansas has navigators to help um, child care programs and providers who maybe also need to maybe bring some of their financial information up to date in order to apply. Like if that's part of it, then let's get it done. But ultimately, I think we also have to talk about moving towards a future where we don't have all these different categories, where we actually figure out how to build appropriate standards for different types of settings. And they don't, they wouldn't be the same, right? You know, but they would exist so that we don't have people who are in or out and we figure out how to create 
create pathways for them to be a part of this important investment that's coming. And the Build Back Better Act does that, but it's hard work and it will be hard work. And it requires states to build licensing standards in conjunction with the programs and providers in different settings, and then create a pathway for all of them and the money they need to do it. But like that is hard work. And that's what we all have to gear up for if that's on the horizon. And it's going to be, it's going to be a project. And so the right now isn't working great, but there are some relief funds available and the future could get better, but we're going to have to figure out how to make that happen. Wonderful. That was a great response. What are some themes emerging from state requirements on how they plan to strategically use the funds, right? So as we think about that, Anne, I'll start with you, equity, you know, support, workforce, recovery efforts, talk to me some about that. Yeah, it's so interesting, I think, too, about it. We've been talking mostly about stabilization grants in this conversation, but states got money that they can also use to bring down or eliminate co-pays for families. And we have a number of states who have done that. Um, for example, Georgia has just bumped their eligibility up to the maximum allowed under current law. And that means something like 100,000 more children will be able to be a part of the subsidy system in that state using relief funds. And that's a game changer for families and really important when we talk about what difference relief funds can make. We've seen a number of states um, build in bonuses for educators um, and programs are getting additional funding if they increase compensation. And I think that's going to be really critical when we look at recruitment and retention in the field um, over the next few months and years for that matter. Um, So those are all, I think, really interesting um, places to start to poke and think about like, okay, great, we've done this good thing. How can we keep it going, right? And like, what kind of a difference would this make in terms of families and our educators, both of whom are driving our economy? Tiffany, did you want to add anything to that question? Well, it made me think about because we're sort of like weaving through two types of funding. One is, I think, around um, appropriate compensation or fair compensation. Um, so we're long term. And then the other one is these sort of like short term um, bursts of, of grants. And I think about that just makes me think about how we're asking families to pay for education, sort of like in the K 12 system, if there weren't a public investment. In K-12, everyone would be paying, you know, like $12,000 a year for their children to be in school. Um, And that's a a screaming deal because um, especially now, having had children at home uh, (laughs) and, uh, you know, virtual school and um, they they just don't pay teachers enough. Um, I think we can all agree with that. And so it just makes me think about is it a matter when we're talking, um, when we're having this national conversation, is it a matter of like a paradigm shift, helping people see uh, not the value, because I feel like the value, there's a consensus that it is valuable, but also that it's worth a public investment in the way that K-12 system has a public investment. And I, again, that's, you know, um, uh, the Build Back Better, it's, it's very exciting uh, that this could be um, coming, uh, but I wonder what role we have um, in sort of messaging that um, and what role we have in normalizing care as part of like this continuum of education. And then you get, it's really tricky because then you have like purists that are like, it's not education. It's, you know, it's different, which I think we're, we mean the same thing. Um, There's like an education or a human development uh, Mm -hmm. approach. There are sort of like two, is it human services or is it education? And it's like, um, it's both. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's intertwined. (laughs) You know, it's interesting too. I feel like something that should be named here as well, connected to what you're saying to me is, sort of like, who who are we talking about too? Um, because there's a real, um, I think, conversation about equity to be had there as well. Um, so when we, it, it is important to talk about these things on the macro level as, you know, the investment and the comparison to K-12, but also let's be real about who's who's doing the work right now and being in many ways, um, you know, 
marginalized, taken advantage of, and not in a way that is like anyone is a victim, but is a result of generations of our approach to how women, and in particular women of color who are caregivers, are treated in our society. And I do think that, you know, that's hard to grapple with. And uh, as someone who does government relations work, I know it's not the rallying cry for every politician I talk to, but it's really important as a place of grounding. Um, and then when we talk about how money flows, because money is ultimately how we get some stuff done and it's how we express our priorities as a country in a lot of ways, as depressing as that is. Thank you, capitalism. Um, you know, <laughs> we then also have to grapple with where is the money going? And I do want to mention, and I, I forgot to say this earlier when we were talking about, you know, we're really funding and, and tackling equity issues is measuring where our money goes and knowing where it goes also, I think, is a helpful part of the discussion so that when we talk about the resourcing of the sector, the sector of women, when we talk about resourcing our youngest children and investing in them, we are clear that we're doing it and we're doing it well in an equitable way. And we have seen some states, um, and in particular, when they have an intermediary helping them distribute stabilization grants, who are keeping track, right? They know, and they are in some cases, and this is like gold star, but it shouldn't have to be something you get an award for, um, is they're transparent about it, right? They're like, these are the programs. These are the providers. These are the settings. These are the areas in the state. These are the um, owners of the programs and their, you know, race and gender makeup. Like we should be talking about that because when we miss on those elements and we're not able to fill in those gaps, we perpetuate some of the inequities with even that exist within the childcare system, much less outside in relation to it. So I know that was a little bit of a mishmash, but my brain was sort of um, thinking through, you know, yeah, let's let's talk about this as a public good, but also, you know, part of, I think, our country's hesitation is is the who and like what, who is a part of childcare right now and, and how hard that is for us to grapple with resourcing it well. That was a beautiful mishmash, though. Right? <laughs> Absolutely beautiful mishmash. Um, I love that you mentioned some forces outside of the education setting that really impact what happens here. What are some other things that would be important for us to address outside of education to ensure that there's going to be an equal playing field for the children? Well, you know, I feel like this came up earlier um, in we, when we were talking about I, I think when we have conversations about childcare, it can happen in a vacuum of the experience and the lives that both the children and families and childcare programs and provide, or educators are having. And for me, what I mean is we have to also consider some of the food insecurity that our children and families and educators are facing. We have to consider some of the housing insecurity that children, families, and educators are facing. We can solve some things about child care, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have solved the um, the realities of poverty and of income insecurity for everyone who's engaged in that system. And that means the partnerships and the works that work that we do. I do it on a policy level and coalition building. So many of you all do it on a community level when you're thinking about who are you working with and, and collaborating with. But, you know, those things come along with making child care available and accessible and affordable, um, we have to do those other pieces too. So I think that's that's one part of the puzzle when I think about what we're what we're facing. Tiffany, do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah. Thank you, Anne. That was a, a good place to start for sure. And just to build on, on your point, I think that there's an opportunity to look at it holistically and to look at, at not just the child, but the whole family. And it sort of reminds me of conversations that we've had in K-12 around these uh, performance metrics, the standardized um, assessments and sort of like tying teacher um, compensation or quality to um, the outcome of those, of those measures and how things way outside of the control of the educator or the school grossly affect the child's performance. So you can be an engaging uh, master teacher 
and be working miracles in the classroom. But if you have a, um, if the child is returning to a home um, that is uh, challenged by material poverty, food insecurity, um, housing insecurity, that's something that even the best instruction, I don't, I don't think um, can overcome. And so that's just sort of what um, that made me think about is sort of like, we think about childcare um, as being uh, something that can um, realize or be a vehicle uh, for realizing the advancement of racial equity, or at least I do. And there are all these other moving parts. Um, and sometimes I, I just sit back and wonder like, Maybe instead of focusing on that alone, how can we um, pull in our um, sisters and brothers that are working um, sort of like in housing and in human services uh, and, and, and really support the whole family? So I appreciate that. Tiffany, I love that. You know, we always know this catchphrase in early childhood that it takes a village to raise a child, but I think we've gotten away from our village. Like we have silos within our village, but like that, hearing you talk made me think about bringing all the pieces of our villages together so that we're working for the good of the whole community. So all families, all children and the whole community, I think um, is, is an opportunity, but the new model, right? We've got a lot of opportunity with Build Back Better. So appreciate you bringing that up. I wanted just to thank you both for just joining this conversation today. I've enjoyed just hearing about what's possible yet, keeping our eyes on Build Back Better and, and thinking about um, a new model and what, what, what we can do and also messaging that, yes, this is a lot of funding coming to the way of early childhood but it needs to be long-term. I heard that loud and clear because it's important for us to message to the greater public that, because there, there could be a misunderstanding, right? To say like, well, you got the money and now that's one and done, but really to understand that it's been long time coming and there's more yet to be done and it needs to be sustainable and equitable and that equal doses of funding is not equitable. So to really get that message out there too, that just, you know, passing out equal, you know, buckets or bundles is not the way there either. So I I'm encouraged and, and, um, just appreciate your thought, um, just your thoughts around these issues today. And I know that our listeners will too. Um, we're going to post the transcription and the related resources on our site at teachstone.com backslash impacting. And we will see you next episode when we will have an exciting and engaging conversation around universal pre-K and what that could mean for families, educators, and communities. And remember, behind great leading and teaching are powerful interactions. Let's build that culture together.